Okay, this is Heat Engines and Refrigeration Cycles, Part 3. In Part 1, I gave an introduction to heat engines and some of the basic thermodynamics of heat engines, including the maximum efficiency, which was the Carnot efficiency. Then in Part 2, I discussed other types of heat engines uh, used for electrical generation and transportation. And in this part, Part 3, I'm going to discuss refrigeration cycles that are used for the, of course, the uh, preservation of food and for air conditioning in buildings. And I'll describe how they work and give a little brief introduction to the thermodynamics of refrigeration. And then at the end, I'll talk about heat pumps, which are actually refrigeration cycles, but they operate in a way that they're used to heat buildings. So this talk is going to be all about vapor compression uh, refrigeration. There are other types of refrigeration, but vapor compression refrigeration is the by far the most common. It's used in household refrigerators, air conditioners, and heat pumps. And it uses, we talked about a working fluid as being the fluid that circulates inside the system. They use a working fluid that's a refrigerant. It's a special kind of fluid that boils and condenses at a, well, a substantially lower temperature than water. And a typical refrigerant that you'll find nowadays in air conditioning systems and the Coke machine out in the hall of, a, of the university would be R134A, which is a hydrofluorocarbon. It's a type of refrigerant that's ozone friendly, and we'll talk about CFCs and the destruction of the stratosphere stratospheric ozone layer in another presentation. But one of the problems with these refrigerants these days, I'm getting a little off track here, but it's worth discussing. One of the problems with the refrigerants in air conditioning systems today is that while they're ozone friendly now, they are very strong greenhouse gases. r 134 a has a 100-year global warming potential of about 1,400. So it's about 1,400 times worse than CO2 in terms of its uh, climate change potential. Anyway, that's just a little bit of a, a, a reference to what's coming up. We're going to talk about uh, ozone depletion and global warming later in this uh, course. Of course, what a refrigerator does or what a refrigeration cycle does is it transfers thermal energy sort of in what's in, in the non-natural way, right? Heat flows from hot to cold and a refrigerator reverses that. It makes energy thermal energy flow from cold to hot. And that doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics because it requires work input. And so one of the things I want to do in this presentation is give you a basic understanding of how a refrigeration system works and a little bit of the thermodynamics of a refrigeration cycle that you can use to sort of better understand the environmental impact of refrigeration cycles. This is a basic diagram of a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And the vapor compression refrigeration cycle consists of a number of components. First, a compressor. So this is like a pump, a reciprocating pump. And the refrigerant circulates around here in counterclockwise fashion. So it goes from the compressor to something called the condenser, then an expansion valve. This is just a a needle valve, a partially open valve, and it's meant to drop the pressure, and then the refrigerant flows to the evaporator. So let's describe how this system works. So we set off with cold vapor. Now this is, for example, one refrigerant would be R134A, so it's a gas, so it sets off as a gas, and then we put it into the compressor and we compress it down. Now what happens? We learned in a couple of places in this course that when you compress a gas, it gets hot. And so we compress the gas and it goes from minus 20 degrees C to 60 degrees C and the pressure increases. Don't worry about the units of kilopascals, but it goes from 120 kilopascals to 800 kilopascals, so at a high pressure, but the temperature is increased. And so up here we have hot gas and the hot gas flows to the condenser. What is the condenser? Well, you've seen the condenser, but you just don't realize it. 
it's those, if you have an older refrigerator, it's those tubes on the back of the refrigerator. They're hot. They're about, you know, maybe 50, 60 degrees hot, hot, and they dissipate the heat to the kitchen. So that's where the heat is lost to the kitchen. So the whole purpose is of this, this is like a little heat exchanger that cools down this hot vapor. And so on the other side of the condenser, after it's gone through these tubes, you end up with warm liquid. So liquid that's not at 60 degrees, but at 30 degrees. This warm liquid then passes through an expansion valve. And the purpose of this is to drop the pressure and to create an expansion. And I remember when we, I showed you in the, the little piston experiment that when you push the piston down, the air got hot. And when you release the piston and you let the pressure go, it gets cold again. So what happens here now is you've, you've got the hot gas, you've cooled it down, and now you let it expand through an expansion valve. When it expands, it gets cold. So it gets to minus 25 degrees C. Now that's cold enough to cool your food. So this cold, uh, it's a mixture of gas and liquid at this point, goes through the tubes. It goes through the tubes inside your insulated refrigerator and this is much colder than your food, so it picks up the heat from your food. That causes the refrigerant to evaporate as it picks up the heat. So it's picking up the heat from the food compartment. That's Q low. And then uh, eventually uh, it converts it all to gas and you go back to the compressor and around and around she goes. And so the net result is you've picked up heat from the food, Q low, and you've dumped heat to the kitchen through the condenser. So that's the basic function of a, of a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So by work, by the function of work input, you've transferred heat from a cold space to a hot space, which is sort of the opposite of what would naturally happen. And so, yeah, here's a picture of an actual refrigerator. This is the compressor. The hot gases come out of the compressor and go into this condenser on the back of the fridge. There's the little expansion valve that cools down the uh, the gas, makes it very cold, and it goes into the uh, inside the refrigerator where it, where into inside the refrigerator where it picks up heat from the food and then goes back to the compressor. So that's the basic function of a uh, of a refrigerator and the vapor compression cycle. You should have a basic understanding of the components and a rough idea of how it works. So that's an overview of how a refrigerator works. Uh, we've talked about the efficiency of heat engines. Now, when it comes to refrigeration cycles, we don't use the word thermal efficiency. We use something called coefficient of performance, which is a measure of the efficiency of a refrigerator or an air conditioner, which are, of course, basically the same device. And the reason we don't use efficiency is because it's a number greater than one. Efficiencies greater than one don't make sense. So coefficient of performance is a, is a more appropriate term. So have a look at this diagram right here. This is, it should look really similar to what we drew for a heat engine. But now instead of a heat engine, we have a refrigeration cycle here. That's why the R. And so here's the reciprocating compressor. Uh, the condenser, the expansion valve, and the evaporator. What's happening is you're picking up heat from the food, right? This is really cold refrigerant here in the evaporator. It's picking up heat from the food, and TL would be the refrigerated space temperature, the temperature inside your refrigerator. You put work in, and QL plus work gets dissipated, gets transferred, right? We have hot gases. We have hot gases at the condenser here, and that heat goes into your kitchen. And so the uh, coefficient of performance is in the same sort of general definition as efficiency is the, the desired result over work input that costs you money. So the desired result in this case is the heat transfer from the food. That's the purpose, is to remove the heat from the food, right? QL is the desired result. And the energy that costs you money is the electricity, the work input that you put to the reciprocating compressor. So the COP of refrigerator is QL 
over the work input. Now, the really odd thing you might find this odd is that the COP of a refrigerator is a number greater than one. It's about three. So for every unit of electricity, every kilowatt hour of electricity that you put in at the compressor, you extract about three kilowatt hours of, of heat from uh, the food. And if it was an air conditioner for your home, it's the same thing. For every kilowatt hour of electricity you pay for your central air conditioner, you extract about three kilowatt hours of heat from your home. So cooling is uh, more, well, it's cheaper. It takes less energy input than heating because refrigeration cycles have a efficiency, and I'm going to put efficiency in air quotes there, have an efficiency greater than one. They have a coefficient of performance. Typically, uh, it varies with the device, but let's say roughly around three. So let's do an example here. This is a an example, a refrigeration example. This is an air conditioner, one of those one little units you might put in an apartment, you know, a window unit. So an inexpensive window air conditioner has a coefficient of performance of 2.8. The air conditioner provides 6,000 BTU hours of cooling to the room, and there's a little conversion that one BTU is, is a unit of energy, which is 1,054 joules. And we want to figure out what's the electrical power consumed, and if you ran this thing full blast for a whole day, uh, which you might on a hot summer day, how much would it cost you if the true cost of electricity, including all the extra costs and the taxes was 27 cents per kilowatt hour. So this combines what we're doing now with that idea of power and calculating the cost of power from one of the earlier chapters. If you go to the Home Depot and you look up air conditioners, you'll see that they're rated in BTUs per hour. It's probably because they're manufactured in the United States uh, using, and so they're reported using British units. But that 6,000 BTUs per hour is the amount of cooling it provides to the room. And it's probably not on the box, but if you go and hit the specs, the specifications on an air conditioner, it will give you the coefficient of performance. And that's typical for a, for a small, inexpensive uh, air conditioner. Better ones could go a little higher than this. So here's a sketch of what we have. We have a refrigerator, right? That's what an air conditioner is. It's just a, refriger it's a refrigeration cycle. And we're, we've got the evaporator here. The evaporator is what picks up the heat from the room and provides the cooling. So this is the indoor side, heat extraction from the room. I've got a little dot over the cues here because I'm going to work in, in power. So I'm going to work in, in, in watts or BTUs per hour. Here's our electrical input to the reciprocating compressor. The hot gases go to the uh, condenser and the condenser rejects the heat to the outdoor. So these are the, this is the outside of the air conditioner where all those fins are. You've probably seen them. And what we want to find out is what the work in is required. So what does the problem statement give you? Is this 6,000 BTUs per hour QH dot or Q low dot? Is, is, is it the energy rejected to the environment or is it the energy picked up from the room? Think about that for a moment because that's central to understanding this problem. Well, as I explained, air conditioners are based on the amount of cooling they provide to the room. So what it's telling you is you're picking up 6,000 BTUs per hour from the room. And what happens is that plus the energy that you put in at the compressor gets uh, rejected to the environment uh, at the condenser. So QL is the heat removed from the room. Of course, we want to work in, in watts. We don't want to work in BTUs per hour. So we've got to do a little conversion here. One of the skills I'd like you to pick up in this course is the ability to do these kind of, I think they're relatively simple conversions. You should practice them. This is kind of a life skill. So we want to convert 6,000 BTUs per hour to watts. Now, I haven't done this systematically, but 
uh, let me just explain this, right? You're given in the problem say, statement that 1,054 joules uh, is one BTU, right? And so you can see, if you write that down, the BTUs calculate cancel with the BTUs. And if you were to multiply this out, you'd have joules per hour. But we want joules per second. So we have to divide by 3,600, right? That's 60 seconds times 60 minutes. 3,600 seconds in an hour. Now you can see the hours cancel with the hours, and you're left with joules per second. And a joule per second is a watt. So it's a pretty easy conversion, given that 1054 joules per BTU, it's pretty easy to convert 6,000 BTUs per hour and show that's about uh, 1.7, 1.8 kilowatts. So that's the cooling that's provided to the room. You're told in the problem statement that the COP is 2.8, and that means that you get, for, you only have to put in, uh, for every unit of, of electricity you put into the compressor, you get 2.8 units of, of cooling, of QL. So we can rearrange this, right? So if I multiply by WN and both sides and divide by COP, we get the work input, that's actually the power input because I've got a dot over it, is the rate of cooling to the room divided by COP. So you, you divide 1,757 watts divided by 2.8, and you only need to put in 627 watts. You put in 627 watts, which is 0.627 kilowatts, and you get almost 1.8 kilowatts of cooling. Pretty impressive, really. So that's why air conditioning is, is actually fairly cheap because there's sort of a multiplier effect because of the COP. So how much does it cost? Well, now we've got a device. This is like a, I've forgotten, chapter two problem where we have a device that's running 1.757 kilowatts. And we're going to run it for 24 hours. So we just got to figure out how many kilowatt hours we have and we've used of energy and then multiply it by 27 cents. So here's another example of the chain rule. Please learn that. It will be on uh, the midterm. So 0.627 kilowatts times 24 hours per day. And uh, if you multiply those out, you would get uh, the number of kilowatt hours per day. And then I've multiplied by 0.27 cents. Well, 27 cents is 0.27 dollars per kilowatt hour, and the kilowatt hours here cancels with the kilowatt hours, and you're left with dollars per day. So it costs, if you run one of these little units that go in the window, one of these small air conditioners, you run it full blast on, say, the hottest day of the year, it'll cost you four dollars a day. Of course, on a cooler day, it'll cycle on and off. It'll cost you less, but it gives you some idea of the cost of of air conditioning, a small room for a full day. Quite inexpensive, I would say, for the comfort it provides. Okay, so that was, well, refrigerators and air conditioners. I now want to talk about heat pumps because this is really a growing area where you're going to see more heat pumps, I think, particularly in Ontario in the near future as we want to, we want to move to a electrical sources of building heating because our electrical grid is is so low carbon. I'll come back to that at the end. So what is a heat pump? Well, a heat pump is a device that's used to heat buildings. It's fundamentally the same as a refrigerator or an air conditioner. So let's look at again at our refrigerator here. We have our food compartment. The heat is transferred from the food to the evaporator here, compressor, condenser, and then it goes to the back of the kitchen. Well, that's, and here's our refrigeration cycle, R. This is what a heat pump looks like. Same thing, I'm able to eat heat pump here, but it's the same thing. Here's the evaporator, uh, compressor, condenser, expansion valve. Exactly the same device, but what's happening here is we're picking up heat from outdoors at the uh, evaporator, and then we've got the compressor and then it goes to the condenser and that heat from the condenser is being transferred to the house. So for a refrigerator, the desired effect is picking up heat from the food. 
For a heat pump, the desired effect is transferring heat to the home. So in this case, the, the heat that's picked up from the ambient plus the energy of the electrical energy that you put in the compressor both end up going into your home. So that's a heat pump. So it's an electrically driven refrigeration cycle, but the heat from the condenser is used to heat your home. There are different types of heat pumps. Some have coils in the ground, and but some pick up heat from the ambient air. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper because you don't have to dig up your yard. So I'm going to talk about air source heat pumps. Air source heat pumps look, look like this. They look just like a outdoor air conditioning unit. They've got a heat exchanger here that picks up heat from the air and through their refrigeration cycle transfers it to your house. The, the really cool thing about heat pumps is that they are actually, they're the same system as an air conditioner. So when you buy a heat pump, you can actually, in the summertime, you can, there's some valving so you can switch which is the evaporator and which is the condenser. So you can operate it as a as a central air conditioning unit in the summertime. So you get two devices in one, which is a bit of an advantage. So the coefficient of performance on a heat pump, same concept as for a refrigeration cycle, the desired result over the work input that costs you money, but the desired result in this case is the heat transfer to the home. For a refrigerator, it was Q low. So it's QH upon uh, uh, the work input to the compressor. So it's the same concept as a refrigerator, but the the useful effect or the desired result is the heat transfer from the condenser. And the typical COP of a heat pump depends on the weather conditions and the price you pay and the design of the heat pump. But typically you could get something between a modern heat pump between two and four. On a nice fall day, you might get a COP of four. So what it's meaning is for every, on a, on a, on a fall day, when you're heating your home, you, you put one unit of electricity in and you get four units of heat to your house. Of course, it picks up the other three units of heat from the ambient. So heat from outside ends up in your home and that's kind of like, put it in quotation marks, it's kind of like free heating. Now you'll see these systems are quite expensive, so they're far from free, but compared to an electric baseboard heater, which we'll talk about, you're getting free heat transfer from the outdoor air to your home. So let's do an example just to demonstrate this. A, a nice, these are simple, simple examples. So suppose you have a home here and here's the condenser where the heat's given off. Here's the compressor, it sits outside, looks like an air conditioner. And here's uh, the evaporator where the very cold refrigerant is and picks up uh, heat from the outside. So the purpose of the system is to supply heat to a home that has a heating load of three kilowatts. So we're, we need three kilowatts here to heat the home. The heat pump has a COP of 3.2. And what we wanna calculate is what's the electrical input to the compressor? And what's the heat transfer rate from the environment? So let's start with the easy one, the uh, electrical input to the compressor. Well, the COP for a heat pump is the heat transfer to the home, that's the useful effect, per unit of electrical energy that you pay for. So make sure you keep that straightforward. That's different than for a refrigerator. And so we can rearrange this, right? Uh, divide by uh, COP and multiply by work input on both sides and you get the work input is QH dot divided by COP. So three kilowatts is what we want to transfer to the home and we're getting a COP of 3.2. So it only takes 0.94 kilowatts of electrical power to get three kilowatts of heat to your home. So that's that's pretty impressive. And so you can get some idea of why these systems are quite desirable. I'll get to why they're not widespread in, uh, later on in the talk. There are some issues at the moment. So that's, that's the electrical power input to the compressor, much less than the heat transfer to the home. 
So the next part asks you how much heat here was picked up from the environment. Well, you can figure this out by using a first law of thermodynamics analysis for the heat pump, right? So we look at what goes into the heat pump and what comes out of the heat pump, just like we did for a steam power cycle. So if you look at QL comes into the evaporator, the compressor work here, the electricity to the compressor goes in, and what comes out is the, uh, the heat transfer to the home from the condenser. So energy in equals energy out. That's conservation of energy, first law of thermodynamics. So QL dot plus work dot in, the work to the compressor, equals the heat transfer to the home. And we want to find out the heat transferred in from the ambient, so we can rearrange this, a little bit of simple, very simple algebra, basically subtracting work in from both sides. And we get uh, the heat transfer from the environment equals the heat transfer from the home minus the work input to the compressor. So three kilowatts minus 0.4 kilowatts means that 2.06 kilowatts was transferred in here, right? Because this is very cold refrigerant and uh, we have the ambient at five degrees C. The refrigerant here might be, oh, you know, minus 25, minus 30 degrees C. So there's heat transfer to the evaporator that's equal to 2.06 kilowatts. And that's the, I've got it, in, got it in quotation marks, that's the free energy from outside that combines with the work with the compressor to make the total uh, heat supply that comes to the house. So that's, that's pretty impressive, I think, how, how heat pumps work. To drive this point home, I want to talk about heat pumps versus electric baseboard heaters. And we talked about this a little bit in earlier in the chapter, about early in the course, where we talked about your TV, you know. If your TV consumes 100 watts, where does that 100 watts go? Well, it just goes into your home, right, as heat. So heat pumps typically have a COP anywhere from two to four. It depends a bit on the weather and, well, the design of the heat pump. Modern heat pumps, uh, on a, even on a winter day, really cold winter day, can get a COP of two. On a fall day, they might be as high as four. So you get up to four kilowatt hours of heating for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you, you pay for, that you, you uh, get, your, get billed for. So, just to make the comparison, what is the COP of an electric baseboard heater? You've seen them. A lot of people put them in, a, in spare rooms where they maybe don't have the best central heating. You've seen these baseboard heaters. You just, they're just electric resistance heaters. What's the COP of an electric resistance heater, do you think? Think about it for a second. They're kind of like your TV. You put electricity into them, and that electricity gets converted to heat. It's the it's the standard game, right? So you put in uh, one kilowatt hour here and you get out one kilowatt hour of heat. So the COP is the useful effect, the heating to the room over the energy that costs. It turns out then QH and WN are equal, so it's one. So you put one watt of electricity in, you get one watt of heat out. So way... Uh, worse performance than a than a heat pump. So these units are cheap. You know, you can buy one for, you know, $54 plus tax, but their operating cost, the electricity to run one of these is about four times more costly than a, uh, heat, a good heat pump. And of course, I should emphasize this because the topic of this course is environment, four times more environmental impact. So you can see the big benefit of heat pumps. This is probably more detail than you need, but I, I, I just wanted to let you know that there have been some really big engineering advances in heat pumps over the last couple of decades. And this is the, uh, there's a, a modern two-stage air source heat pump now, which really works well. Uh, this is the COP of the heat pump versus ambient temperature. It's easier for uh, heat pumps to pump 
heat into your home on a warm day than it is on a really cold day. But even on the worst cold days, you know, in, in, in Toronto, maybe minus 20, minus 30, a good modern uh, two-stage air source heat pump can have a COP of two, meaning that you're getting two units of heat in your home for every unit of electricity that you put into your uh, into the unit. Whereas on a nice fall day, maybe 10 degrees, you're getting something like uh, four units of heating for every unit of electricity that you put in. That's pretty pretty impressive. This is taken from a research paper. I just wanted to show you that modern heat pumps are pretty amazing devices. So you might wonder why we're not using them. Why are we mainly using natural gas? And there's a desire to get away from natural gas because natural gas is a fossil fuel and it emits carbon. So we would really like to use uh, something that is much more efficient and, and more, well, lower carbon. And air source heat pumps are a really nice option for and a viable home heating option for, with very low CO2 emissions in Ontario. This is a unit that's made by Mitsubishi. I think it's called the Zuba unit. It's a couple years old, so I don't know if this is still sold, this one. But one of the issues right now is they're quite expensive. They're not widely adopted, and you know how it is when things are not widely adopted, the first adopters pay a high price. So they're about $9,000 installed. That's about two or three times a mid-efficiency natural gas furnace. Now, one of the benefits is you get it. It's basically a central air conditioner as well. I looked up my price of how much I spend on natural gas in a year. For me, and I have a fairly moderately big house with my both of my wife and I have home offices. So we spend about $1,000 a year on natural gas. And so the payback time would be pretty slow. What you really need to make these units take off is carbon pricing. Carbon pricing will make, well, it'll raise the price of natural gas. So you'll be paying for the actual price of the carbon emissions from your natural gas furnace. That's one thing. But carbon, carbon pricing would make it the payback time uh, much quicker on a unit like this. Also, with more people buying uh, air source heat pumps, which would very quickly happen when you uh, raise the price of carbon and make natural gas less attractive, the price will come down, just like the price of everything else. You know, the price of the first big screen TV, uh, LED TV, was really expensive. And then when, when everyone adopted them, they become uh, very cheap. So, Carbon pricing is definitely a way to go to make this. And I think we're going to see if the Canadian government gets serious about climate change, then, you know, and we, we have car widespread carbon pricing. I think you'll see a lot of people switching from natural gas heating to these air source heat pumps. Now, I added a little proviso here. I said it's a very low carbon home heating option for Ontario residents. Why did I add that? Why does location matter in terms of GHG emissions? Why would this not be a good solution in Saskatchewan at the moment? Think about that for a moment. That's a good kind of exam question. Well, the reason is, of course, these are electrically driven. And where does electricity come from in Saskatchewan? We talked about this. Saskatchewan still has quite a lot of coal fire generation, particularly lignite. They're trying to phase out coal. The Trudeau government's trying to get them to phase out coal, but they're still using uh, a very high GHG fossil fuel to get their electricity. And if you run one of these units because it runs on electricity with a high electricity that comes from a high GHG source, you lose uh, most, if not all, of the benefit. The big advantage in Ontario is we, we have nuclear, a lot of nuclear power, hydropower, wind power that is almost completely carbon free. We just use a little bit of natural gas for peaking power. So our electricity in Ontario is very low carbon. So if we switch to electrically heated homes through air source heat pumps, we will, and we get off of natural gas, will greatly reduce our, our carbon footprint associated with home heating, which is, I think, a great thing. Okay, and that ends the section on heat engines and refrigeration cycles. Please have a look at the readings, and now you can try problem set number five, which is posted on D2L.